brother. Looks like there's trouble in Marvel Paradise. Daredevil born again. Being born again. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another video with Swaggle Haas. And in this video, we need to talk about the uh, latest story coming out of the Hollywood Reporter. Daredevil, the series Born Again, axing its current writers and directors, shelving everything that they filmed so far, and actually starting the entire series over. In fact, Marvel Studios is revamping and rehauling the entire television department. And so in this video, I wanted to talk about it. I know that this is a comic book YouTube channel, and you guys are probably thinking, hey, Swagaha, show us some comic books. ASM 124, First Appearance of Manwolf. Happy Halloween. There you go. Now we're going to talk about this because uh, this is my YouTube channel and I get to talk about this stuff and this is sort of tangentially related to comic books and I think that this is an interesting topic and I want to talk about it. And before I used to think, hey, you know, only guys with YouTube channels that work in entertainment can actually cover topics on their YouTube channel talking about entertainment. Only guys like that. And then I realized, hey, I'm a guy like that. I have a YouTube channel and I work in entertainment and I can give you guys my opinion on the state of entertainment and talk about some of the problems. Because while this is a good sign that it seems like the foot has come down, Papa Feige is telling these people that we need to step it up, I'm not really so sure that this is going to be the cure to the disease that is tech's involvement in the entertainment industry, which again, I think is the biggest problem but I'm gonna talk about that later on in the video. So first, we're gonna start with the article here. I'm gonna cover this and talk about what is actually going on. And then later, we're gonna take a little trip to Rant Town, and I'm gonna to explain to you from my perspective what some of the biggest problems and pain points are with writing and bad writing in today's Hollywood environment. But of course, before I get into it, if you guys could like, comment, subscribe, but let's get into this video here today. Now, here you see the article, Daredevil hits reset button as Marvel overhauls its TV business. Launched during the pandemic with a playbook to shoot 150 million plus seasons with no pilots, the Disney unit is undergoing growing pains in seeing the logic of traditional TV culture. Now, I'm just gonna cover some of the highlights of this article here from The Hollywood Reporter. We're not gonna belabor it, but I, guys, I want you guys to understand uh, some of the context of what is going on, and then we can kind of widen out a little bit and really, really get into it. It didn't take long to see the problem after Marvel Studios' Daredevil Born Again paused production in mid-June during the writer strike. Fewer than half the series' 18 episodes had been shot, but it was enough for Marvel executives, including Chief Kevin Feige, to review the footage and come away with a clear-eyed assessment. The show wasn't working. So in late September, Marvel quietly let go of head writers uh, Chris Ord and Matt Corman and also released the directors of the remainder of the season as part of a significant creative reboot of the series, The Hollywood Reporter Has Learned. The studio studio is now on the hunt for new writers and directors for the project, which stars Charlie Cox as Matt Murdock, uh, a blind lawyer turned superhero. The article goes on to say, through it all, the company eschewed the traditional TV making model. It didn't commission pilots, but instead shot $150 million uh, plus seasons of TV on the fly. It didn't hire showrunners, but instead depending on filmmaking executives to run its series. And as Marvel does for its movies, it relied on post-production reshoots to fix wasn't working. We're trying to marry the uh, Marvel culture with a traditional television culture. More on that in a minute, says Brad Winterbaum, Marvel's head of streaming, television, and animation. It comes down to how can we tell stories in television that honor what's so great about the source material. The article goes on to explain some of the pain points and some of the intricacies of uh, you know past projects, but I want to finish out with this paragraph here. Even though the company does not have a writer's first approach to TV, directors could feel shortchanged as well. The whole fix it in post attitude makes it feel like a director doesn't, doesn't matter sometimes, says one person familiar with the process. And I want to, again, emphasize this line right here. We're trying to marry the Marvel culture with the traditional television culture. And the culture, I think, is really uh, some of the biggest problems with current entertainment. And I guess we're going to talk specifically about Marvel, or at least, you know, how Marvel approaches some of this stuff. As I explain some of the pain points here in entertainment today, at least from my perspective. Now, when I say the word culture, I know what you guys are thinking. You guys are thinking wokeness. Wokeness has absolutely destroyed all entertainment. No matter where you go, you're gonna read articles about it, you're gonna watch YouTube videos about it, you're gonna hear people talking about wokeness. And while I will say, wokeness has become a problem with a lot of entertainment properties out there. 
I think wokeness ultimately is a symptom, not necessarily a disease. Because here's the deal. Here's the thing. If you waved a magic wand and you got rid of wokeness tomorrow, do you think that all these entertainment properties would actually be good again? Do you think that that's all it is? That wokeness is the end-all be-all of what makes these shows bad? I think you'd be lying to yourself if you said that that was the only problem. It's not actually the problem. To me, the problem has always been tech's involvement in entertainment. The proliferation of the corporate tech way of doing things being injected into what is effectively a very creator-driven creator medium, a very auteur-driven medium, whether it be in the TV show side of things where you have a showrunner who is really the main voice of a project or in the you know filmmaking side of things where you have a director in that case that is really the you know uh, the shepherd of basically the point of view of that particular movie and the problem right now is entertainment has been well I'll just say it corrupted corrupted by this process now we're going to get into the weeds a little bit with this one guys okay we're, we're going to get a little bit personal about uh, some of this stuff and uh, hopefully you guys find this uh, type of discussion interesting you know again I, I've, I've been trying to think of a way to really bridge this topic uh, I thought maybe I would do a whiteboard video with this I might still do a whiteboard video uh, talking about this topic but based on you know this current uh, news that came out uh, I felt like, you know, let me just kind of put it out there. Let me let me just kind of shoot from the hip a little bit. So uh, this might get a little bit uh, long-winded or ranty, but I think this is good stuff. I think this is good um, good uh, information I can share with you guys. And, you know, it's my perspective is one thing, and maybe you guys disagree. But here's the deal. We, we need to talk about tech, all right? We need to talk about why this is the problem. And I, and I realize, like, a lot of the narrative, again, has been – this sort of wokeness corrupting entertainment and, uh, you know, Bob Igar like uh, being, you know, uh, beholden to like an ESG score and things like that and all these sort of buzzwords and stuff. And again, I'm not here to say that it's not a problem. That stuff has been a problem for sure, but it's not the only problem, you know? I mean, and, and to think that that's actually how sort of the day-to-day -day things operate is, is kind of just silly. Right? I mean, like, do you actually think that Bob Iger, like, walks into, like, gets off the phone with BlackRock and then, like, walks into the She Hulk writer room and says, hey guys, we need to add, you know, more feminist jokes in this show here today? Like, of course not. Like, do you actually think, like, Bob Iger probably hasn't even seen She Hulk, let alone had any involvement in the making of the show. Now, it is true that certain filmmakers and creatives and stuff, can have these political opinions and then they can infuse that into their work. And then ultimately they either execute it or they don't, right? And a lot of people, you know, in this current environment have not been executing well, you know? Politics in film and entertainment isn't necessarily the problem, right? I've been on the Film Courage YouTube channel. I've, I've given this answer before somewhere out there, my face is on a video and I've talked about this. It's like, it's not really a problem to have politics in you know a creative property like there's always going to be um things that are allegorical to what the creators and directors and the writers actually feel you know it really just comes down to their execution you know is it good or is it not good right the joker is a very political movie right and was it good or was it not good you know it's, it's up to you to decide like people thought it was good because todd phillips made it good the dark knight has political takes and a POV. Is it good or is it not good? You know, it's, it's all about the subtlety, right? You, you can have things that are allegorical to what you see in this current political environment. You just need to make it tastefully done. You know, when you put Donald Trump in a project, like, yeah, it takes you out of it a little bit. Or like, you know, an effective villain who like looks like Donald Trump, then it gets a little bit silly. But we're going to table that aside, right? So we really need to talk about the tech side of these things and how every creative decision now is being made under the guise of best practices and our metric show and big data has told us and analytics have told us and best practices show this and we understand that the data shows this and every single creative decision is informed in that way. You're gonna have every single company now, Amazon, Apple, you know, Disney at this point, whatever it is, all Netflix, 
all of these things are going to be, you know, uh, we, we want to be data informed, but not data driven. When in reality, they're always data driven because every decision they make is based on the metrics that they show. They green light these shows based on, you know, what seemingly has been proven to be true through their numbers. And while that can work with some things, the problem is, is that a lot of times those metrics and that data doesn't tell the full story and doesn't show the full picture. There's this really, really great clip of Steve Jobs. If you guys have ever seen this one where he, he talks about, um, you know, how companies can lose their way if they have a monopoly, you know, in a certain market. You have two types of people in a company. There's the product people who are the craftsmen of, you know, whatever it is that the company actually makes. And then you have the sales and marketing people that sell that product, right, out to the masses. And the reality is, is that when you get a monopoly share, say you're the MCU and you have a monopoly on the, on the superhero movies, the idea of creating better movies and better product is no longer how you need to succeed in your current monopolistic environment. The idea of how you succeed now is how to market better and sell, sell better. And those people who work in those departments who actually have no understanding of what it takes to make a good creative product are the ones that get promoted and they get put into the form making decisions and they're the ones that, you know, eventually start to steer the company away from what made the company good in the first place, which is creating good products. And in film and television, which is by and large a very auteur driven medium, you have to have one person for the most part, have a very clear vision of this is what the show is. It makes it very, very hard for those types of people to get selected and approved in these corporate structures and in these corporate decisions. Because the problem is you can't prove to a marketing person, to a data person, you can't quantify your creative sensibilities. You can't go into a room and say, I think that Iron Man's suit should look like this because I just think this is right because I just feel my creative genius. You just have this sixth sense for it. That doesn't, you can't show your work on that to people who are looking at numbers and spreadsheets and data and tracking analytics and saying, well, we see audience retention rate goes up at this point in this particular Netflix movie. Therefore, uh, what people liked about it was when we told the goofy joke about the alien creature. Like that's how they derive what is a good product is they look at all these metrics. And at a certain point, these companies really start to undervalue you know, the, the talent that it actually takes to create some of these properties. You know, you have people like, like a James Gunn, you know, and I, I, can, I can just imagine how James Gunn has informed, you know, what Marvel Studios has chosen to do with all of his projects. I mean, just think about this. Like, you know, he comes out with Guardians of the Galaxy 3, and then you have all these marketing people and all these, uh, you know, producers and all the stuff that works in this uh, giant corporate environment you know, now that the uh, Marvel Studios is a big machine and it is a giant corporate environment. And while I don't necessarily think that, you know, the filmmakers have to necessarily interact with, say, the toy sales department, it's going to filter in eventually to some of those uh, conversations about, you know, uh, looking at the scripts and things like that. So they're going to have to cross some of those bridges. But they look at a movie like Guardians of the Galaxy and they say like, OK, wow, this is massively successful. OK, uh, and then they go into their research departments and they stuff and they try to de deduce what is it about this uh, movie that people really liked? And they get all these, you know, uh, surveys and polls and things like that. And people say like, well, oh, we we loved uh, uh, the explosions in space. We loved all the wacky characters. We loved the music. And so they take these elements and they say, OK, explosions, wacky characters, jokes and music. Hey, that's all we need to do. We can just put that stuff into the next project and it'll be just as successful. And they really fail to understand like what it is about the nuance and the craftsmanship that James Gunn actually put into that to actually make it work. They think that people are just laughing at the joke because there's a funny raccoon, you know, talking to a tree, but they don't actually understand the nuance of what made that joke actually work for that audience. And so that's why, you know, no disrespect to say the, the Marvels, but when you watch the Marvels trailer, it's like, this feels extremely derivative of everything that you see in Guardians of the Galaxy, you know, and, and, and it, it has less to do with, you know, whatever the wokeness elements you think is in that movie and way more to do with this is 
sort of a mandated thing that they said to these filmmakers and stuff that, hey, we need to put more jokes in this. We need to undercut scenes and, and make sure that people laugh every five minutes because our analytics show this. Hey, you know what really worked well about the Guardians of the Galaxy movie? People love music. Our numbers show. Best practices show. Our data shows that people really, really like old nostalgic m music in their scenes. And they really fail to realize that what made the music so great in Guardians of the Galaxy is that it's actually a core element to Peter Quill's character, right? It has his nostalgia and it is his sole connection to his past human self. And there's a reason and there's a thematic story narrative purpose to have this music actually play a role in this film. And then when you watch the Marvel's trailer and you have Beastie Boys Intergalactic Planetary, and you just think like, oh, well, that's funny because it says Beastie Boys and oh, I remember Beastie Boys and oh, Intergalactic Planetary, they're in space, right? But what does that have anything to do with who Captain Marvel is or Monica Rambeau or Kamala Khan? Has nothing to do with their character, has nothing to do with their core. So here you have this movie that has all the elements that our metrics show as to what should be successful because this is what we see, but you don't have the authorship. You don't have the craft that actually is able to execute it there. And then this is one of the problems is that you are in situations now where people have to mandate these things. You know, you, you, if you guys can only imagine, you know, I, I think a lot of people out there think like, well, why doesn't Kevin Feige just say that this thing sucks? Or why doesn't Kevin Feige do this or whatever? And it's like, as powerful as Kevin Feige is, at this point, these are massive machines. Like these are massive corporations. And he's just one person. Like he can't, he can't just go into a room and say, this sucks and shelve it. Because one, he would be reported to HR because he can't be mean today. You're not allowed to be mean. So that would be a problem. And he just has to smile and play the game, right? Like he can't just be so cutthroat about it. Now he can have influence on who people hire and he can say, hey, I think we should get these creatives on this project. But again, I think it's at a point now where he's not making all of the decisions. I think there's so many producers, there's so many people working on different projects. Think of how much content is being made. He doesn't have his hand in everything. There are people who work under him that make a lot of hiring decisions at this point. Certainly he has a final say in stuff, but he, you know, you're only gonna pick your battle so much. If he disagrees with a certain filmmaker and then a producer under him is like, no, 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 I like this filmmaker. I mean, like, he's not gonna worry about it. Like, even if he, he's just, he's not, he's gonna say like, it's fine. Okay, hire who you want. Like, he's not going to put his foot down on every single thing, at least not until now, which is, you know, in the current state of the economic market where things are. This is why we're seeing articles like this, where now he probably is in a place where, hey guys, times are tough. These projects aren't working. We're not getting the ratings that we need. We're not getting the revenue that we need. And he's finally able to gain the reins back on some of the stuff, which is why this is happening. But again, it's a boom and bust cycle where like right now he has that creative control, but eventually when things turn the ship and things get better, you know, eventually things are going to expand again and then it's going to be out of his hands and then all of the decision-making things are going to be made once again by all of the analytics and the data-driven stuff and all that. And that's really the problem, you know. I, 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 I'm reminded by, like, a, let me give you a little bit of uh, story time, a little story time, you know. It's just, I, I'm telling you, man, you, you go into some of these rooms and, and the people, like, I don't want to be mean, but just like the arrogance you know, coming from somebody who gives you notes who like, has, like never has spent a day on a film set, you know, and, and they're just trying to get you to explain a sensibility that you have. Like, how, how do you, how, how can you prove that people are going to like, you know, um, the color purple in your neon sign? I don't know. I just like it. It's my choice. I just want to make a purple sign that is the color purple. Like, what's the problem with that, you know? But in these data sets with these types of people, you have to prove everything. You have to show your work for everything. And it's crazy. And then you get these mandates that it's like, you know, we really think audiences like music 
in these movies. You know, we really need to make sure that we have a musical scene. They have these things that you just got to shoehorn in. You know, the writer's just like, what? Why would I put a musical scene in this? So, well, we just think that it would be really, really good. And then this is that interesting point, right? This is that interesting point with, with uh, you know, where the craft of the current writers and directors come in. Because this is what separates the men from the boys or the women from the girls, you know, in this situation is you get a note like this and you got to make it work. You have to make it work. And a lot of times I think what happens is these things get noted to death where they have to make these things work. And the truth is after a while, you know, your resilience just goes down. Like you just don't care after a while as a writer, right? You, you, you just hit that point. I'm sure like you guys, you know, if you ever worked on something, you just hit that point where you're just like, look, t t just tell me what to do. I don't care anymore. Just, just tell me what to do. You want a music scene? Okay. Music scene, you know, and, and, and it really becomes that where you just have to insert these things and the true talent, the true people that are the miracle workers can inject these notes and make them work. And not only make them work, they can actually improve the movie. Like somehow, miraculously, they incorporate this music scene and it actually ends up being great. And then all the marketing people are just like, yeah, see, that, that was my idea. But they don't understand that this writer had to like spin their wheels and this director had to like figure out, okay, how does this actually work and how does this actually make sense? And that's why, you know, people like Marcus and Mephili and the Russo brothers and stuff, it is, it is the most monumental achievement for them to have pulled off the Avengers movies. You think about work operating in these corporate structures, like, my God, like, I don't care what anyone says, it is a thousand times harder to succeed in that space than to make, you know, an indie Oscar movie and win an Oscar. Like, it just is. Like, it just is. I mean, look at Chloe Zhao, right? She can win an Oscar and you put her in the MCU system and then she makes the Eternals and it's like, you know, it's awful. So, anyways, this is what uh, my little rant is, you know, uh, interesting with uh, the Daredevil stuff going on right now. Uh, I think that this is a good sign, a good indication that they're trying to seemingly put everything back into the hands of creatives and let these people be the storytellers and let these people be the auteurs and be the captains of the ship and actually say, hey, this is the movie I want to make. This is the, this is the, the TV show I want to make. And hopefully, hopefully, you can not only find those auteurs, but you can also find the team players because it is, again, connected to the MCU. And again, that is where the genius lies with people like Marcus and Mephili and the Russo brothers is not only do they have strong, clear visions for what they want to do, but they can do it inside a system that actually um, pays tribute to the other films and the other movies that have laid a foundation for it. You know, you don't, you, you also can't on the other end of this, you can't get a, a, say like a David Fincher or David Lynch and put him into MCU. I mean, they're just going to go bananas with the stuff and they're not going to care about all the other history and lore that exists within the space. So you have to find that perfect unicorn person. And I would say that this is at least the right step, but will it eventually fix the entire MCU? So long as, you know, analytics and all that stuff is the way that creative filmmaking choices are made. And believe you me, data-driven stuff is a huge, 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 huge part of all of the creative choices that are made in these films. Um, I'm not so sure that uh, we're going to be totally out of the woods yet. But anyways, that was me on my soapbox. How long was this video? Oh my God, it's so long. Nobody's actually watching this video at this point. I probably just went on a rant. Nobody actually cares about this stuff. Can I show you guys some more comic books? Here, I've been reading Sword and Sorcery. Sword of Sorcery. Go read it. Howard Chaikin. Anyways, that's all I got. See you on the next video.